Massimo Piliucci, good to see you. Good to see you as usual. Uh, welcome to everyone in the Sophia audience, meaningoflife.tv, bloggingheads.tv, available on streaming video and audio podcasts. This is the Sophia program. I'm here with Massimo Piliucci. Um, Massimo, uh, today we are going to talk about expertise and philosophy. Um, yeah. And... Um, the occasion, you know, we could have talked this about this in the general, but there's a specific occasion, and I think it's actually a good way to get into it, and that is that you wrote a piece on Medium responding to another piece that was written by a former philosopher who now I believe is a dean, um, yeah. um, and um, on the subject of public philosophy. Yes. Um, and the, the question of expertise sort of came up within that context. Could you give a little the summary of, what it was that she that she had said that you would, and we'll link to all these things. What she what she had said that you reacted to that then caused you to write this piece, and how you see the question of expertise as intersecting with the question of public philosophy. Yeah. So so first of all, a little bit actually even broader background. Uh, that particular piece that I responded to was sort of one of a series of things that have come up uh, over the last maybe year or so um, of often professional philosophers themselves and, and also, of course, non-professional philosophers uh, who are, I don't know, upset, uh, incredulous or something when somebody says that philosophy is a profession, which I would think is kind of a no-brainer. Um, and I've argued that not only it's a profession, but like every other profession, uh, it implies expertise, it, it implies training, it applies a certain certification of that training. You know, you get a PhD in, in, uh, in philosophy. Um, lots of people seem to react really badly to that sort of notion because they, they want to argue that philosophy is for everyone and everyone is a philosopher. In a sense, that's true. I mean, we, we, we can presumably talk about this in a few minutes. If you understand philosopher as Socrates or the Stoics understood it, Right, everybody who is who is interested in living a philosophical life and in thinking about uh, what they're doing and why they're doing it. And in fact, I am a major proponent, as you know, of that view of being a philosopher. That does not that is not exclusive, however, with the uh, notion, the parallel notion that this is also a highly technical field of expertise where people get trained and spend a lot of time getting trained. And and you know, we should make a distinction between these two things. It's it's a little, a little unfortunate actually, that we use the same term, philosopher, uh, for both. What I also completely disagree of on the other, with, on the other hand, is this notion which uh, uh, bumps around, you know, that, that is thrown around on social media quite a bit, that, oh, anybody who thinks is a philosopher. Well, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> that, that is not a philosopher in either one of those two senses. Right? Now, in, specifically about the article that you're mentioning, which I assume we're going to link to. Yes, I'm going to link to everything. So you can go yeah. ahead and just talk about it. You don't have to fill in all the background because we'll right. have a link to the piece on right. the. So the article specifically is about, as you said, public philosophy. And, and there, you know, I consider myself a public philosopher uh, in the sense that I spend a significant amount of my free time uh, sort of writing for the general public, giving talks to the general public uh, and, and, you know, generally being involved, you know, facilitating uh, philosophy cafes and things like that. That, in my mind, is public, public philosophy. Now, of course, Leave it to professional philosophers to complicate inordinately what public philosophy is, right? It's like, like oh, no, no, there's different dis- definitions of it and certain things fall into it, certain other things don't fall into it. Whatever, we can have that discussion, that's fine. But one of the things that hurts me a little bit is when people say things like, oh, a good public philosopher should uh, learn from the public just as much as, uh, you know, he or she is, is uh, sort of teaching to the public or presenting to the public. No, I'm sorry. That would mean that I have no specific expertise to offer to the public. You definitely want to hear what the public has to say. You definitely want to be responsive. uh, And you certainly should be learning from any experience in life, including that one of being a a, a public philosopher. But I think it's more than a little bit ridiculous to argue that, you know, we're going to learn just as much from the general public as they're learning from us. I, I also hear similar things being said about students. Oh, you should learn, a good teacher should learn just as much from the student. No, that's a bad teacher. That's a teacher who doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. 
Of course, I learn from my students. Of course, I need to pay attention to what my students are. But, you know, there's a reason why they are the one paying the tuitions and I'm the one being paid uh, to, to, to be there and talk to them. So that's the kind of thing that I was reacting to. All right. So let's, let's, let's go through some of the pieces of this, right? So um, first thing between the two senses of philosophy, let's just say there's two senses that, you know, we could, we could make it a gradation, but let's just say there's two senses. One sense is sort of the, the sense that which someone like Socrates is a philosopher, which of course there's not the indication of formal education, formal degrees, um, um, and so on and so forth. And then there's the, the sort of, post-industrial revolution professional sense of philosophy, disciplinary sense of philosophy as a profession. Right. Um, and certainly that simply, it's simply a matter of fact. I mean, this is not disputable. This does require credentialing of various kinds. Go and you try and get a job. Go try and get a job in a philosophy <laughs> department with no degree and no right. education and see what happens to you. I mean, you won't get one. Right. But I mean, so here's already where the sort of first, and I agree with you that philosophers are necessarily complicated, but here's where there, there are some genuine complications. So here's one genuine complication, it seems to me, that arises immediately. And that is that a lot of the philosophy that was done by the first kind of philosopher is grist, is the subject matter of philosophy done by the second type of philosopher, right? In other words, yes. Apparently, there are some people or have been some people without any credentials who were able to do philosophy at such a high and sophisticated level that then the later people who do have that professional connect credentialing find that what they've what they've written or said as 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 very fertile ground right. for investigation. So is this a complication or do you think there's a way to talk about that intersection that leaves the distinction relatively intact? Now, I think there is a way to talk about the distinction uh, and, 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 and maintain it in, in this sense. Yeah, so Socrates is the guy that usually comes up in this yeah. discussion. I hope Socrates did not have a PhD. Well, well even, no kidding. even Enlightenment philosophers who aren't credentialed sure. necessarily in philosophy. I mean, Descartes was sure. a mathematician, right? I mean, sure. So, Absolutely. But let's stick with Socrates for a minute yeah, because yeah. it's the obvious example. Right? Sure. Like, oh, Socrates is not a, a, have a PhD. Well, no kidding, Sherlock. There were no such things as PhD at the time, right? In the first place. <laughs> now, not only that, but it's not just philosophy. Darwin did not have a PhD. Mm. Galileo did not have a PhD. Yeah, yeah. Okay, right? fair. I okay. Now, in all of those cases, we are talking about, first of all, notice, historically different periods where there simply was no such a thing as a professionally trained, uh, you, you know, uh, credentialed systems, systems are credentialed and so on and so forth. But also we're talking about situations where those respective fields were actually fairly early on in their own history. Okay. Um, Galileo and, and, and Darwin were literally at the beginning of modern physics and the beginning of modern biology. Right. Now, Physicists, biologists, chemists, and so on also did not have, you know, PhDs and, 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 and sort of standard academic careers until somewhat recently. In yeah. fact, the entire academy has gotten far more specialized and more based on credentials and, and formal training, et cetera, et cetera, during the 20th century, particularly after World War II. I mean, things started a little earlier. But after World War II, the thing just really got, got, yeah. got, 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 got going, in part, of, in part in the case of the sciences, because... Uh, you know, federal agencies got into the business of funding science and so on and so forth. Universities became, you know, you know, the, the house, the housing, housing, uh, increasingly number of departments uh, and, and people that wanted to have a career that still want to have a career in either the sciences or philosophy or literature or anything else, really an academic career I'm talking, they had to specialize. You know, uh, Socrates, Galileo, and, and, and uh, Darwin had the luxury of having the entire field basically pretty much open. They could, you know, discover or invent or talk about anything they wanted. Today, if you want to be an astronomer, sorry, <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a hell of a lot more training and it's going to take a lot more specialization. So in a sense, there is, there is a way to save those two things that are not incompatible simply because the fields themselves have evolved. Right? I mean, sometimes people talk as if, uh, philosophy is the same thing now that it was 2,000 years ago, or, or science is the same thing now that it was 300 years ago. It isn't. These are social activities of a particular kind, and yeah. they therefore evolve. Yeah. And it really strikes me as strange to say, like, like you yourself pointed out a minute ago, right? Yes, it is very, it, it, obviously Socrates, Galileo, and, and Darwin did not have PhDs. But try to become a professional philosopher, physicist, or biologist today. Yeah. 
without formal training and good yeah. luck with that. Yeah, no, I, I'm, and I'm not, um, I'm not meaning to, to be uh, pedantic or nitpicky at the edges like <laughs> no, that. No, no, I know. What, what, I, what I'm trying to get at is whether there's anything to this idea that philosophy is maybe a little bit different from other subject areas um, in, in, the, in the type of subject it is and in the type of, um, a type of knowledge and skill set you have to bring in order to it in order to do it properly. So I, let me just yeah. w- run this one more round before we get onto the next aspect. Um, okay, so let's forget about degrees and degree granting institutions. Let's just talk about formal education. Okay, sure. Um, to what extent would someone like a like a Descartes have had formal education in the history of philosophy? To what degree would someone like, um, uh, 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 let's say, an Aristotle who attended Plato's Academy, right, have had a formal education? In other words, to what we understand as a formal education is a very specific sort of thing. It's a very specific type of course structure and exam structure and all this sort of thing that we take as being necessary for the credentialing of people to teach and to do research in these areas. Now, I'm pretty sure that whatever education they had, it was not of that sort, right, uh, to a great degree um, in right. philosophy. Um, um, and I don't know about other subject areas. To so correct. is there still a distinction that we'd want to make that makes it a little more fl- pliable in terms of... I, I wouldn't make the distinction on those lines. I think there is a distinction. Uh, uh, but, and, and, and we're going to hopefully turn to that next. But um, I wouldn't put it along those lines for a couple of things. First of all, again... There is a difference between different historical periods. And so you should be, we should be comparing, you know, who do we know today who is a freelance philosopher without background knowledge and actually contributes to the technical field of philosophy? I can't think of that many people. In fact, I can't think of any um, at, at, on the top of my head. I think, did, doesn't mind. Kripke lack a PhD? Maybe, we, we can check. <laughs> I wasn't, yeah, okay, yeah, anyway. We can check, but, you know, one sure genius are, in 3,000 exactly. years is not exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and this, I'm sure there are some, you know, there is the occasional oddball in physics or in biology who, without formal training, actually contributed to the modern technical field. But those are really exceptions, right? So the, the reason why things are different now, as opposed to historically, is precisely because the nature of the discipline has, has changed. But also, let's not forget that actually some of these, a number of these people did have training of some sort, sometimes formal training of some sort. Yes, they didn't go to a PhD granting institution. But, you know, there were lots of schools. As you mentioned, Aristotle went to the Plato's Academy. Aristotle himself established the Lyceum, uh, where a bunch of other philosophers were, were trained. The Stoics had their own school, where they also trained, you know, the second and the third head of the Stoics, and so on and so forth. Uh, Descartes was definitely trained. I mean, he read a lot of the classics. Yeah, he was trained in scholastic philosophy. A lot of his yeah, stuff is, is reactions to scholastic philosophy. Because I guess I was thinking what, more in terms of what, what, I mean, how much is it, would they have received the volume of education that someone would have received by the time of a PhD? Or would it be more like what we would think of as an undergraduate education and then a lot of very high level sort of conversing discoursing uh the the aristotelians were famous for the parapetos sort of walking around i guess i'm wondering how much of the training would have been what we would call the stuff that happens in between the classes right yeah and how much would be the actual forming formal sitting and being told taught oh i'm sure that that the setting was very very different and yes there was a lot of uh, in between classes so to speak or also a lot of reading on your own uh, going to libraries and then talking and corresponding to other people with other yeah. people again not just in philosophy Galileo did the same thing he corresponded in fact with Descartes among other <laughs> among other uh, uh, individuals right because there was no sharp distinction between philosophy and, and natural science at, at, at the time as far as being equivalent however to undergraduate uh, sort of learning today I don't know about your undergraduates but no mine, I didn't mean in terms close. of today but just I meant more <laughs> okay. in terms of the form that yeah. the bulk of your time sure. is spent in a classroom Yes. And agreed. that's where most of the learning happens as opposed to, let's say, a more diffuse. I agree. It was a more diffuse uh, way of, of learning, but it, there still was formal training. You, can't, you couldn't just get up in the morning and say all of a sudden out of your own brain without any, having read any of the classic texts, without having talking to anybody, that, oh, yeah, here I am, a philosopher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so with regard to um, this issue of sort of, philosophy and other subject areas. I mean, I do guess that one of the things is that there is at least a subset 
of the philosoph- of philosophical questions that are pretty much questions that every person at some point interrogates for themselves in the course of their lives. There are then a whole other set of questions that are very highly technical, specific. Um, I doubt whether most people on average are thinking any time in their lives about, you know, the re- respective merits of, of bivalent and multivalent logics. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but there is a subset of, of questions that are sort of um, um, ubiquitous. Um, there, there are questions that go to the human condition. Um, um, yeah. So is there not, in a sense, something about philosophy that is intrinsically different from a lot of the other uh, disciplines and that at least a core part of its subject matter, matter have to do with questions that everyone wrestles with over the course of their lives? Uh, well, yes and no. So first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you're so optimistic that most people actually pose themselves those questions. That hasn't been my experience, but okay, let's go with that. Well, even in an inchoate matter, even when you're sure. a child or, you know, you wonder about death or, or you're, you're a teenager, you wonder about your yes. purpose, your place in the world. I mean, you sure. know. But um, if you're a child, you also wonder about why the, the sky is blue and then you're doing science. It's yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> um, now, uh, that said, again, I, don't, I certainly don't. I'm not going to argue that, you know, let's say science and philosophy are the same kind of discipline or they should be fought in the same kind of way. That, that's definitely not what I'm arguing here. Um, in fact, if, any, if, if we want to find reasonable analogies, they would have to be within the humanities far more than, than within the sciences. Um, you know, you can make the same argument, for instance, that, you know, everybody read books. That doesn't mean that they are literary scholars or it doesn't mean that they're literary yeah. critics, yeah. right? Um, well, we're going to get to the question of what the expertise really precisely yeah. consists of. Right. But I just, right now, I'm just interested with respect to the subject area. Sure. Um, so, but um, the subject area, right? So if you read books in your novels, uh, you, you're dealing with the same subject area as a literary critic, but in a very different way. Uh, or even more simple, uh, a simple example. Uh, so if you're a Christian, you're dealing with the same kind of, uh, you know, practicing Christian with the same kind of questions that a professional theologian deals with. But you're not a professional theologian. And in fact, the way in which a professional theologian deals with these things is at a much higher level of abstraction that is simply irrelevant to most regular Christians practicing their, their religion. Just like uh, yes, we can all wonder about the meaning of life, but the way in which sort of professional philosophers, even ancient professional philosophers, um, dealt with that problem is so far more sophisticated than what most people you know, t- tend to think about on their own, that that's why there is an asymmetry. That's why uh, it is a good thing uh, to, to, for, for people to actually go to a philosopher and say, hey, well, what's your latest on this thing? Well, how, how do I think about this stuff? Yeah. And, and you know, I, I'm not sure that I'm... I'm not sure that I'm actually opposed to the sort of view you present. I, I'm not sure yet what my view is because I only read the piece and then we had a brief Twitter exchange in which several other people were involved. And then, and then, right. so, so I, I don't, I'm not sure I, I'm tr- right now I'm just trying to get a sense of what your view is yeah. fleshed out. Let's talk about this thing though. Now about philosophy versus philosophers versus public when they are engaged with each other. Yes. And uh, on this, as, a t- as a side issue related is the issue of students. Um, and here's what I sort of want to get at. Now, I haven't done these cafes, and so I can't really comment on that. You've done that, and maybe you can bring your experience to bear on this. But I've taught a shit ton of students, as of you. <laughs> Although I've yeah. been, I think, in this business about twice as long as you, so I probably taught a yeah. lot more students. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so here, here's, here's what I'm thinking about, right? So, look, there are certain kind of classes – which are completely top down, right? Yeah. So when I teach a course, I taught a course called Topics in Analytic Philosophy since Quine, right? It was top down. Yeah. It's me. These are not things these people have thought about, or if they have thought about them, you know, questions of let's say realism and anti-realism, they've thought about them in such a basic way in comparison to the highly technical, highly sophisticated way that it, you right. find it in Quine. And so there really isn't, I'm not really getting much from them. I will say, and I've told you this before, that I do get a lot from the doing of it. In other words, I find that I understand things a lot better when I can explain them to people who don't understand them at all. Absolutely. But that particular, so let me interrupt you for just a second. Yeah, go ahead. That particular phenomenon of, yes, you you actually clarify things to yourself when you either write about them or teach them to somebody else. That is absolutely true. And but it's again true across the board. When I was a practicing scientist and I was teaching science and I was writing about science, that was to say I had exact same uh, you know, experience. Oh, 
I understand this much better now that I have to teach it and you know explain it to people who actually don't don't yeah. know much about it. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's absolutely true. But again, it doesn't draw in my mind a distinction between philosophy and anything else. Okay, so now here's the second kind of example though, which is, strikes me as very different, and I wonder what you think about it. So when I teach a, a course like philosophical ideas and literature, which I'm teaching right now, yeah, um, I find it's a very different experience, very different dynamic. So the course, the version I'm currently teaching is a course entirely on novels by Philip K. Dick. Oh, nice. And the, reason, and the reason why I use Philip K. Dick is because his books are just, the only word I can think of are pregnant with ph- interesting philosophical questions, conundrums, right. just dilemmas, and so on and so forth. Ethical ones, societal ones, political ones, and so on and so on and so forth. Um, now there, I find when I teach that class, and I, have, and I always get a very interesting mixture of people, I get a good number of non-traditional, so older people. My university has a very nice program where if you're a senior citizen, you can take uh, six hours a semester for nothing. Nice. And so I'll get older people in my classrooms, which are really great when they interact with the 20-year-olds and stuff. It's wonderful. Right. Right. So here's what I find in those kinds of classes. I find that really the only advantage that I have over them is a certain sophistication in articulation, yeah. maybe a certain sophistication in interpretation and reading, yeah. but that I find as often as not the most substantive, interesting contributions are coming from the room and not from me. Um, and, mm-hmm. and especially when questions arise as to the implications of some of the things that Dick is writing about in the 60s are – for contemporary life, in which case some of the younger students are actually closer to some of the phenomenon than someone like I am who's already a bit past it, a bit out of date, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So do you not think that that, that that indicates at all that at least within some areas or applications of philosophy, there's a bit less of a role for expertise other than purely in a formal sense? Or, would you, or do you still want to sort yeah. of... Well, so I've had that kind of experience for, for many years. Uh, I, I run philosophy cafes for like a dozen years at this right. point. And even though I have less experience than you uh, do at teaching undergraduates in philosophy, um, uh, I do run similar kind of courses. In fact, interestingly, uh, last year I taught a course on Philip K. Dick. No philosophy. way. Yeah. Oh my gosh. How could I have not spoken to you about this? Okay. <laughs> well, all right. philosophy okay. and science fiction, right? Um, yeah, so, okay. Right. So I've had exactly that kind of experience. But I do think, my friend, that you're selling, you may be selling yourself a little too short. And, and here's what I, what I mean. So yes, I've had that same experience. And of course, when we're talking about these kinds of topics that are more uh, of sort of broader interest and where people have life experience, of course, the, the, the conversation becomes more dynamic. And my own contributions to the class or to the discussion group are proportionally less than if I were teaching, let's say, you know, advanced class in, you know, philosophy of biology or something like that, right? That's, that's absolutely true. There's no question about that. But what I do find is that most of the contributions there are, as you, as you yourself just, just actually hinted at, are about, you know, real life experience. So my students, younger students tell me things that I don't, I'm not, you know, aware of because I haven't you know, uh, kept up with, with either pop culture at the moment or their own experiences, obviously, w- which are different from my experiences growing up. You know, I, I grew up in a different country, in a different culture, in a different time period, et cetera, et cetera. Those I certainly learned, absolutely, from them. Um, but what I contribute to, this, to the discussion in those, in those cases is, is sort of the, the high-level framework, the way to think about certain things, the tools to think about in a more sophisticated way about these things. So for instance, whenever we're talking about, you know, Philip K. Dick, uh, a lot of issues in ethics come up, right? And the students find it incredibly useful right at the beginning when I, when I do a little bit of meta ethics and I say, look, uh, guys, there's, there's a number of different uh, ethical frameworks out there uh, that you can compare and you can use to filter through your discussions, your upcoming discussions. You can have you You can be a utilitarian. You can be a virtual ethicist. You can be a deontologist. And depending on how you look at things, the same exact problem, the same exact uh, uh, ethical issue will actually look different, differently. And and they so the light bulbs go off. That is expertise that they don't have 
I am not learning anything or much at a meta level, at a level of frameworks from them. I am providing those. But yes, I am learning a lot about their specific experiences. And that actually is what makes the, the thing fun. I think, however, that said, this is all, of course, a, gra- a, a, a graduation. Right? It's, 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 a, it's a graded thing. It's, it's a matter of, uh, it's not a sharp distinction of any kind. You have a general public, which is heterogeneous and, and normally with a fairly low level of sophistication about technical philosophy. You have initial undergraduates who are not that different from a general public. You have advanced undergraduates who now already have enough courses in philosophy under their belly that they can actually contribute much more to the discussion and, and maybe perhaps point out things to you that you didn't, didn't think about. And then, of course, you have graduate students. Now, with the graduate students, the more, especially the more advanced graduate students, you really do learn uh, almost as much as you provide because they are, in fact, almost colleagues, right? That's, that's, the, that's the whole point of a PhD program. You're, you're actually shaping, uh, essentially, future, future colleagues. So I do I agree that it's a gradation. But I still think it's, it's strange to want to argue that a professional philosopher talking to any audience whatsoever is going to learn just as much. This is the, the, the recurring phrase that happens in these social media discussions uh, from the public or from their audience. Uh, and in fact, they, they ought to. There's even a, a sort of a moral injunction there. They ought to learn as much. It's like, uh, no. <laughs> well, yeah, and look, let's bracket because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stipulate and grant this right away. I mean, I think within that, there's an awful lot of pandering, false humility, yeah. Um, 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 almost kind of self aggrandizement by these displays of kind of like generosity that are insincere. I, I don't disagree at all. I think that that's true. Um, I think unfortunately it is somewhat related to philosophy's obsession, uh, today, apparent a real obsession, um, to the point I think of, of almost uh, mania with marginalization and oppression and all this stuff and, and even standpoint epistemology if you think about it yes. some part of what's implicit in it is that some people just simply know better than you just simply by virtue of being who they are and having had certain experiences that supposedly you haven't had right. um, 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 and so I do think that you know there is a bit of this that even comes from theory it's not yes. just false humility I do think and you know I don't know this is not a place to talk about standpoint epistemology, but I'm wondering if you think that standpoint epistemology to a certain extent has given a theoretical ground for um, um, uh, at least the sort of skepticism about uh, expertise. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree. And, and I think that is problematic because, uh, you know, I certainly am going to grant that some people that, that fall into different sort of social, economic, et cetera, et cetera, categories <laughs> Well, I've had experiences that that you and I might not have had. You probably had experiences I didn't have, and vice versa, right? <clears throat> and so that, in so far those particular personal experiences are concerned, they obviously are the ones that should talk about it because you know it's personal experience. The problem comes up when when the the next step is taken that somebody who has not had those experiences does not, and in fact cannot or should not comment or or criticize or or expand or something like that because, you know, they literally don't know what they're talking about. No, we're all human beings, thinking human beings, rational human beings, and, and, and there is a contribution that can be done because these people tend to forget, incidentally, that having had a personal experience does not guarantee that you are going to be objectively reflecting on that personal experience. In fact, quite the opposite. Uh, it means that very likely, you know, this is what we know from, from cognitive science, very likely you have a lot of in, uh, you know, inherent biases about your own experiences that you yeah. interpret in a certain yeah. way. Yeah. And so the whole point should be to have a dialogue among, among different agents and different perspectives so that, yes, I'm going to learn if I pay attention and, and, you know, and actually listen to you from your different experience, but you will yourself be able to analyze and reflect critically better on that very same experience, precisely because I'm giving you a different point of view that you may not have considered. So, yeah, I do think that standpoint epistemology, which is well-intentioned and does have some good points, when pushed too far, it's dramatic, and it does, I think, you're, I, think I agree with you, it does uh, provide some kind of theoretical background from, from the discussion, to the discussion that we're talking about, that we're having. 
So let's now talk about what you think the expertise actually consists in. So now something that you just said, you used an ex- a formula that, um, that um, to describe something that I'd said earlier that I, that I want that I want to continue using. I think it's indisputable that philosophers have one form of expertise that, that is, that can't be denied. And that is mastery of a certain tool set, um, um, an analytical critical tool set. Um, right. There have been times when I've been more in, on, inclined to think that that's the majority of what their expertise consists of um, with perhaps the uh, also expertise with respect to history, the history of the literature, the history of the literature. Um, but presumably you think the expertise goes much farther than that. And let's just stay right now on the academic side and not the, with respect to the academic side and not the, the lived side, because I want to, I want to deal with that separately. Okay. I suspect you and I are going to probably be farther apart on the lived side. Sure. So let's just stick with this side. Um, what beyond the tool set, mastery of the tool set and knowledge of the history of the literature, do you think philosophers have over their non, over the non-professional philosopher counterpart? Well, for one thing, depending on how you define tool set, uh, that's fairly large. That's a lot, right? I mean, we're talking about certain fields in philosophy where there had literally been discussions for two and a half millennia, right, from the pre-Socratics on. Yes. Um, so this is a huge literature uh, that most people, obviously, outside of philosophy are not aware of, nor would you expect them to be aware of. Now, those discussions... Uh, remember, they're obviously filtered in terms of qual- quality over those two and a half millennia, right? We don't, we don't know uh, or we disregard what a bunch how much of rubbish. Was, how much rubbish was written on yeah, it? So right? just, <laughs> yeah, the <laughs> rubbish on. is all gone, or at least most of the rubbish is gone, right? Um, so what we have is la creme de la creme, and, and, but that's a large amount of creme <laughs> it's, it's because it's been going on for two and a half millennia. So being acquainted, uh, you know, deeply acquainted with that literature in and of itself provides you a lot of different ways of asking questions, of pursuing answers to those questions, et cetera, et cetera. Regardless of whether we're talking about metaphysics, ethics, aesthetics, logic, anything, anything you like. So there's that. Here, hold oh, on. Wait, hold on. Yeah. Go, ahead, go ahead. Sorry. And then there is the, the, what you call the tool set. Now the tool set is I, I like to explore how would you how do you think about this because if by by tool set I mean uh, obviously not just being acquainted with the literature but also having a certain number of ways of thinking about those problems right having certain frameworks that you can help yourself uh, in framing questions in pursuing questions and those frame those tools and those frameworks are not available to gen- to the general public again unless they've done so the, the background the background work so. Are we saying that uh, that isn't enough to, uh, to, to, to make a fairly sharp demarcation between professional philosophers and uh, lay people? Because it seems to me that's a lot. Well, so here's what I'm... It's not that, it's not that there isn't a difference between philosophers and lay people. What I'm, I guess I'm so wanting to say is that perhaps it's a different kind of difference than the difference between, a, between uh, let's say, a molecular biologist and a lay person. Oh, um, yeah. And so, I would agree. So here's where I'm getting at. And by tool set, I mean something like the co- a combination of linguistic and logical tools. Um, um, okay, great. Uh, sure. Um, by which to and crit- critically engage with various questions. Right. Um, so let's take, you said metaphysics. Great, great example. Okay. Um, or epistemology. Okay. Um, yeah. So I both have mastered the tool set that we're, that is used to ask questions and pursue disputes within metaphysics. And I have a pretty decent handle on the literature, the history of the right. literature. Okay. Right. Um, does that make me a greater expert on reality than a person who doesn't in the same way in which, right. Um, if I'm a molecular biologist, um, not only have I mastered a set of tools, but I am now an expert on life yes. in a way in which an ordinary person is not. I mean, that's, guess where, I guess, where I'm getting at. That's is that, perfect. Isn't that different? It is. But okay. I think it's different in an interesting way, which I hope Please. is make my case. <laughs> so, so it is. Yes, absolutely it's different. But what's the difference? That the, the molecular biologist, of course, knows 
empirical things about the world. It doesn't only have tools to pursue those, those questions. Uh, it doesn't only know the literature. It also actually has a lot of knowledge, actual knowledge about the empirical world as it is. The, the metaphysician does not. But the metaphysician has knowledge about how to think about the world, right? In the similar way, that's why I said earlier that a better analogy is not the sciences, although I don't want to exclude the sciences at all because I think it's a, there's a family resemblance of, uh, along a continuum. But a better comparison is with other humanistic disciplines. For instance, let's take history, right? Um, is a professional historian better able to uh, make what we would call historical decisions in the year now because he's an expert? No, I don't think so. Um, does he know how to think better about the history of humanity than anybody else who is not a professional historian? I would certainly hope so. Otherwise, he's wasting his time. Um, so why is that? Because he has knowledge not only of factual things about past history, not only about the literature uh, produced by other historians on, on those particular subject matters, but he has a bunch of tools in, available about how to think about history. He's aware of different, the different theories for explaining certain historical events and so on and so forth. And that's what makes him an expert. And what is he better at? Well, he's better about what his job is, which is thinking about history, not making history, right? So similarly, the philosopher or the metaphysician is better about thinking about reality, not actually discovering empirical reality, because he's not a physicist. He's yeah. not a biologist. He's not, you know, it's a different, of course, it used to be that the two were one and the same, right? Uh, all the way up to Galileo. But once that they diverged, uh, then no, we have a division of labor, right? The scientists do the actual empirical work and the metaphysicians or, you know, the philosophers of science or something like that, develop a different kind of expertise, an expertise about how to frame things, about how to think about things. And I would argue, in fact, they're better at those things than the scientists. That's why philosophy of science, for instance, has interesting contributions, I think, to make to science. Not because it does science. I mean, philosophers of science don't do science, generally. They don't get into the lab and discover new things. That's the job of scientists. But they do have that perspective, the broader perspective, those tools, those analytical tools you're talking about, so that when scientists themselves get into an impasse, like, for instance, right now, the discussions that uh, are to be had in fundamental physics about so-called post-empirical science and that sort of stuff, that's where the philosophers may come in and say, hey, you guys, we have some tools to think about this stuff. You might want to, you know, have a seat at the same table and talk to us about this thing. That is a form of expertise. Yeah, the thing is that, you know, I'm, uh, and actually, I'm, I'm, I didn't real think of it before, but now I'm realizing it should have been obvious that so much of what we're talking about now is actually related to the three dialogues you and I did on the book that you published online on the nature of philosophy. Yes. Um, 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 you may want to link to those as well. Yeah, I'm That's going right. to, um, right. because I'm realizing a lot of the things we're talking about are continuations. I guess part of what I was thinking of was something of the of the following sort, and that is that the reason why the biologist acquires a certain expertise about um, um, life that a layperson doesn't have is because there is a kind of an independent fact of the matter about biological life that there is to discover. And what, if you've yeah. discovered it and somebody else hasn't, you know more about it than they do. Sure. But I guess that in philosophy, I'm more and more coming to the view that I think that in, with regard to most philosophical questions, the answers ultimately suffer from indeterminacy, that, the, that, the, that there isn't a correct answer, um, and that the, to the extent to which some answers are better than others, it depends on the framing, what you're, what, what you're trying to find out, what you're trying to do. It may vary with respect to the circumstances, certainly with regard to ethics. I think that's the case. Yes. And so I guess I, I don't think that in philosophy, the subject matter is of the sort that one can have that kind of expertise about it. Um, um, there is a fact of the matter as to how organisms operate. And thus, if you know those facts, you're better, you, you have more expertise than the person who doesn't. But I don't think that there's a fact of the matter about whether 
uh, the world is mind independent or whether mind and world are intertwined. And, and, and as notoriously, as we've discussed, it actually makes no empirical difference from the standpoint of, of a side. You could be a scientist and be an anti Barclay. Correct. As as but so um, let me then, let, then let me try a different yeah, kind of analogy. Yeah. So take a logician or a mathematician. Uh, there is no fact of the matter about the Pythagorean theorem or Fermat's last theorem or things like that. If they're not things that correspond to objects out there in the world, and yet I think we would agree that mathematicians do have technical expertise and knowledge, right? But knowledge of what? Uh, they don't have knowledge of factual matters. They have knowledge of how to deal, what kind of tools to use in order to, 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 to explore what essentially are the consequences of certain actions, right? I mean, that's, that's how mathematics and logic, in fact, which I still consider a branch of philosophy, uh, work, right? So you say, oh, hey, if I start with these axioms, what are the consequences? What, what, how do I, what, kind of, what kind of stuff, uh, things do I get? What kind of outcomes do I get out of, you know, let's say, moving from Euclidean geometry to, to, to spherical geometry? Uh, what kind of things follow? Well, philosophy is analogous there. I mean, when you say there is no fact of the matter about, let's say, different ethical systems, I would agree. I mean, that I think that to ask whether Kantian deontology is true, it's a category mistake. It doesn't make any sense to me. But it does make more sense to me to ask a, a question about different ethical systems, similar to what you might want to ask if you, if you talk about different kinds of geometries. So what is entailed by the assumptions of Kantian deontology as opposed to what is entailed by the, the, uh, the assumptions of, let's say, utilitarianism and things like that. Then in philosophy, things are more messy because it also actually, in fact, does deal with the real world because ethics does deal with the real world. So it's not quite as clear cut and, and, and sort of pure as, you, as, as mathematics. But I do see the two, uh, the two kinds of activities is very similar. That's what philosophers do. They start out with certain assumptions instead of axioms, and then they try to figure out what coherently emerges or develops or is entailed by certain assumptions, which is why a lot of discussions in philosophy, in technical philosophy, look to me a lot like discussions, you know, like different mathematicians or logicians exploring different areas of, of logical space. Um, when a utilitarian, for instance, defends himself his position against the deontologist, what's, what's happening there? Well, the deontologist is pointing out a particular set of unpalatable you know, outcomes or, or consequences of the utilitarian position. The utilitarian, position, the utilitarian defends himself by saying either, no, those actually don't follow logically, they're not entailed by my system, or okay, I'm going to patch it this way. Let's say I'm moving from original utilitarianism to rule utilitarianism, so to prevent that kind of move on the part of the, of the ontologist. That yeah, seems to me to be a lot of what's going on in philosophy. Yeah, and the re I deliberately didn't use ethics because that then crosses us over, I think, into the thing about expertise regarding lived living, and I, I sort of wanted Fine. to... but the same goes for metaphysics. I, I'm right? not sure, but so here's what I'm not sure about. So, I, you know, I, I was thinking both metaphysics and epistemology. And, you know, you raised the question of mathematics, and this came up in our discussion about your book. Um, um, you, think, you think philosophy sort of lies somewhere sort of in between, the space in between mathematics and natural science. Right. Um, I was inclined to think philosophy is, is a lot more like arts. Um, um, and so, so he, let me just try this out, and you tell me what you think of this. So the way, the way I think about mathematics, and, and you're absolutely right in the sense that there is a kind of expertise in, ap, in mathematics that does in a way seem a little bit like the expertise that I described for the biologist and that there's a, you know, there's a fact of the matter about these things that, you know, once you know them, you know more about them than the person who doesn't know them. Um, and you said, well, but the point is that these are entirely human created things or just, you know, but it almost right. seems to me like with mathematics, what really brought winds up happening is once you lay down the axioms, you in a sense create a world that then has its own, then, it ha then about which there are then facts of the matter, right? Once yeah. you lay down the Euclidean axioms, there's now a, a type of space that exists about which there are facts of the matter. Um, sure. that, 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 that. Now, I don't think that that is the situation with something like between an externalist or an internalist in epistemology, right? So one of the things that happens with respect to uh, people trying to react to Gettier cases um, is people start to see the shortcomings with the internalist uh, conception of justification, right? Um, because I can have good reasons for believing something, 
that are actually completely based on misinformation, right? Um, yes, as as the Gettier cases um, or the variations on them uh, uh, suggest, right? Um, so um, if I see a sheep in a field, um, I have a damn good reason for believing there's a sheep in the field, even if th- the belief is caused by uh, a fake sheep uh, behind right. which that which I cannot see behind, which is an actual sheep, right? right. So um, but on any internalist notion of justification, I have good reason for thinking there's a sheep in the, in the, in, in the field. But right. if you were then to say, well, does that mean you know there's a sheep in the field? That people say, ah, I don't know, because you kind of, you kind of got the truth by accident, right? Yes. Um, and so that's pushed some people to externalize, like Alvin Goldman famously, to, to yes. externalist notions of justification in which, no, you don't have a good reason unless your, your belief is actually caused by the thing that is the truth maker, right? Right. Okay, fine. Now, there are various advantages and disadvantages to taking one view or the other. One consequence of the externalist view is that if you go that way, it's very hard to, to construe um, justification as normative, right? Um, um, and thus, the whole concept of epistemic virtue becomes difficult to articulate um, because in, in an externalist epistemology, there's nothing wrong with knowing something by accident, right? You may not be aware of the causal connection between you and the truth maker. Okay, so these are, this is, these are all hotly discussed things. Right. I can't imagine what would count as the independent fact of the matter that would that would say it tell you, this way is, is, is correct and that way is not correct, such that if the person had it, he would be a bigger expert, right? Basically, there are different ways of thinking about reasons, right. and they have different things that recommend them and don't recommend them, and right. which way you fall on it depends a lot upon things like your own temperament as well as the situation in which you're deploying the conception of a justification and what you're deploying it for. And I think a lot of philosophies like that, a lot okay. of it. Well, let's let's leave temperament. That's my out. best stab at it. So let, let all right, sounds good. Please, please reply. Um, so so let's leave temperament out because actually studies show that it, that's true also for scientists. In science scientists, as well. So, right? yeah, 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 <laughs> scientists yeah. tend to go for one idea or another, at least initially, as a matter of temperament preferences. Are, are those studies, by the way, done in psychology? Who's doing? Who's done yeah, those psychology. studies? Yeah, psychology. It's, it's psychology. That's very so, interesting. So go social on. psychology of science. But um, so let's leave temperament for a minute uh, aside because, you know, temperament, yeah, it, it, right. it is a constant. It, it does happen. I'm not saying it doesn't, but it's kind of a constant across, across uh, fields. Um, right. So I would definitely agree that what, everything you, ju- you just said is perfectly fine with me, which is why, of course, I'm not saying that, sci- that philosophy is like, exactly like, or, or very close to uh, mathematics, or, and certainly not very close to, to science. I do think that philosophy is its own thing, its own beast, and it has actually elements of the natural sciences, logic and mathematics, and I would agree with you of even more um, clearly humanistic disciplines. I wouldn't go as far as the arts, um, but certainly history, literary criticism, and things like that, right? So... But that doesn't mean, again, that there is no expertise. For instance, in the case that you just described... No, the question is, what is the expertise in? That's the question. Right. The expertise is about the way these debates are framed and what follows from what. For instance, I can imagine that somebody who does not have expertise in epistemology doesn't even begin to follow what, what you just said about internalism versus externalism and things like that, let alone being able to come up with a reasonable criticism of either position, let alone uh, to come up with any kind of improvement of in those positions. As, we, as you know, because of the discussion of those videos that you mentioned, I do think the philosophy makes progress in that sense. Uh, different branches of philosophy make progress in the specific sense that they explore a number of possibilities in sort of what I call loosely speaking logical space, some of these possibilities get discarded. Other of these possibilities get refined, right? So utilitarianism, I'm sorry that I go back to ethics, but, um, uh, and I do want to get to the practical part of the Yeah, that's going to be next. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, in, in ethics, because that's the area that I know, that I know better probably to, together with philosophy of science, you know, it's not like modern utilitarians are anything like John Stuart Mill or, Be- or Jeremy Bentham. Um, why not? Well, because plenty of people have pointed out the limitations of those positions. In fact, even, even Mill himself was an improvement over Bentham, right? Why is that? Because people realize, you know, well, it depends on who you ask. But Singer, typically that's, Singer doesn't think so. I mean, yeah, or Peter is Singer's a Benthamite, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, he is. But the thing is, um, <laughs> But that's not the point, right? I mean, to say that he doesn't know about it. 
No, of course he knows. Crazy, about. but but he completely would disagree with someone who thinks that a utilitarian is an improvement. That a million, but he doesn't. That a million is an improvement. Right, but he, he wouldn't agree, he wouldn't do that by going back to Bentham and staying there. He has to answer whatever questions and whatever objections have been raised, right? So he may say my utilitarianism is closer to Bentham than to Mill or something like that. Fine, but he cannot have the same reasons that Bentham. Uh, you know, without improvement. Um, and that's because people have come up with cogent criticism of those positions or of the consequences of those positions, right? So that's how philosophy makes progress. And if philosophy makes progress, then, then there is a form of expertise and there is a form of knowledge. Because, again, it's not knowledge of matters of fact, but it is knowledge of the different types of positions, how they are defended, how they, they can be developed further, and so on and so forth. The same goes for epistemology. I mean, the, you mentioned Gettier. Gettier himself, as you know, was a, a considered a major development over, on epistemology over you know, the previous two millennia. And that has generated a, what has become later, in fact, a cottage industry. Uh, uh, of sort of responses and counter responses, et cetera, et cetera. If you followed them in the, those videos that we did um, uh, previously uh, were based, of course, on a series of long blog posts that I did for several months, basically a book length thing uh, on the nature of philosophy. And one of those blog posts has an in depth, in depth mapping of in the major positions concerning the Gettier uh, discussions. Yeah. And you can see there how they evolve. The positions build on each other, and they yeah. sort of they do counter. You know, they, somebody puts forth something, and then there is a counter, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, does that does that count as knowledge? I think so. It's not knowledge of factual matters. True, it's not knowledge even of mathematical theorems. Also true, um, but I, I I don't understand in what sense that could possibly not count as knowledge. Look, the like I is, said, I don't think I, I'm not. Look clearly. The philosophy professor who's studied this stuff like I have has a, a better tool set than the student or the lay audience, knows the history of the literature and the debates better than the tool than, than the student, which and the combination of both means that they are better able to debate the issues than the students. Right. But does that make them experts on knowledge in the way that the biologist expertise makes them an expert on life? I don't think so. No, it can't. Because it, there's no, no independent fact of the matter as to Right. What the correct but, view is, right? All right, but now we're talk, talking about epistemology and, in fact, talking about actually semantics. Uh, and, and I'm not about to spring a this is just semantic on you. Well, I, if I'm, I'm doing don't... that, then I need to know because I didn't no, no, know no. what it you're not. Please, please. No, you're not. And I'm not going to spring the just this is just semantics because that's, I think that's a, that's a way to avoid a discussion rather, rather than get into it. Of course, it's semantics because if we don't understand, if we don't agree, on each other's use of the terms, then that we're not making any progress in our discussion. So I think that part of the problem here, not just in the discussion we're having, uh, the two of us, but also in this broader conversation that, that I've been having uh, back and forth over the last year on social media and blogs about knowledge and expertise in philosophy, is that knowledge has multiple instantiations. Like facts, there are different kinds of facts, right? So forget philosophy for a minute. Um, Mathematical facts are very different from empirical facts, okay? So just because people use the word facts in both cases, and just because they say that they have knowledge of facts, we should not be confusing the two of them, right? Uh, a mathematician does not have factual knowledge in the same way in which a biologist has factual knowledge. They're very different. In one case, it's the knowledge is a, a matter of coherence, uh, of, of uh, positions coming out of certain axioms. In the other one, it, it is a logical entailment, and in the other one is a actual correspondence of, you know, more or less, uh, as, as much as we can determine that, with how things actually stand outside in, in the outside world. So similarly in philosophy, I mean that there is knowledge, but that knowledge isn't the same as either mathematical knowledge or uh, uh, scientific knowledge, although I think it's closer to mathematical knowledge than 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 uh, uh, than uh, physical knowledge. Than, so could than you run this with respect to my example of the difference between what the biologist knows is expert in and the epistemologist? Right. So yes. I'm, so the biologist just said on those two now because I, I'm still not seeing the. All right. So the biologist knows what he knows. He knows. Uh, about the tools of his, of his trade, right? How to use 
the tool, the actual tools. I mean, I'm talking about, you know, getting into a laboratory thing. He knows about the conceptual tools of his trade, you know, evolutionary theory and what it impl- entails or, uh, you know, the, the molecular biology and, what, and, and how it works, etc. And then, of course, it has factual knowledge of a large number of things about the biological world, right? Now, the philosopher has the first two. It doesn't have the third. He has the, right, that's what I think. Yes. But why isn't that a substantial difference in terms it is. of expertise? It is a substantial t- difference, but it doesn't negate either knowledge or expertise. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, I'm, not, I'm never made the argument, sorry if I wasn't clear from the beginning, but I never made the argument that philosophy is in a different thing from these other stuff that we're talking about. It is. All I'm saying is that those differences do not, in my mind at least, in any way justify a rejection of the notions of either knowledge or expertise in philosophy. It yeah. is a different kind of expertise. Yeah. And yes, if you want a, an, an even closer analogy, that's probably expertise that it's closer to, let's say, the expertise of a literary critic or, or you know, an English professor or something like that, or a Shex, yeah. you know, Shakespeare uh, expert, something like yeah. that. Yeah. You know, it's actually, now that I'm thinking about this, I, I think I'm almost seeing what you're getting at more through an illustration than, than something I could articulate abstractly. And I've brought this up before, this quite remarkable thing you were involved, panel you were involved in with Dan Dennett and Lawrence Krauss. Oh, yeah. And one of the things that struck me was, you know, look, clearly a theoretical physicist or cosmologist knows a lot about knowledge, right? I mean, they can't, and yet, you could see when the subject turned to sort of epistemological questions that Krauss was completely out of his depth. I mean, he didn't even understand the sense in which mathematics is clearly a priori and not a posteriori, right? Um, And he wasn't even as sophisticated about it as Mill is in system of logic when he tries to argue that mathematics is a posteriori. There's a sophistication to Mill's analysis that is completely lacking in Krauss's. Right. I guess I just find it a little hard to articulate in the abstract what that expertise consists in, you know? Fair um, enough. But, but um, you just brought, 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 uh, pointed to an example where somebody literally did not know, as in did not have the knowledge uh, necessary to actually engage in that discussion. Of course, Krauss thinks he does. That's uh, because he's full of himself. Yeah. But um, that's a different issue, right? Um, but what's interesting is that he knows about mathematics better than any of us. Right. And he knows about reality in a set the world in a sense better than any of us and yet he doesn't know something about the relationship between mathematics and or knowledge right. of mathematics and knowledge in the world absolutely right that's, that's in the same sense that's in the same sense i think or in a similar sense in which a biologist knows a lot more than about biology than a philosopher or biology yeah but that the biologists, I wager, with very few exceptions, don't know enough about the nature of their own discipline as compared to a philosopher of science. So because that's what the kind of knowledge of philosophers of science have. Let me ask you one more thing about this, and then we'll go to the practicals. I don't want to yep. go too long. Um, is that the sense in which that... So, so Jerry Fodor famously um, said that... Um, um, what philosophers essentially do is, is, is provide a kind of rational reconstruction of, of a practice or of an, epi- an, an area of knowledge, um, and that that is a fundamentally distinct and valuable activity from the sort of first-order practice of the knowledge. In other words, that's why you need philosophers of science um, yeah. in addition to scientists. Um, and I guess the question I have is, the last question I have then is, um, what is the value of the, both the capacity to perform and the knowledge of those already performed rational reconstructions. Well, I would agree with, first of all, I would agree with Fodor. Yes, that's a, a lot of what at least modern philosophy does, because again, the field yes. has evolved, right? Um, I'm not talking about the life stuff. I'm talking yeah, just right. Because, you know, let's remember be, be, before the, you know, the, the 1600s, the philosophers were the ones doing science as well. Yes. Right. Um, what is the so, value of the rational reconstructions we perform? That understanding is a distinct sort of ex- expertise, better understanding of, of what we're doing and why, right? So, an understanding is different from knowledge, right? If we if by if by knowledge we intend we, we mean factual knowledge, right? So, the biologists, the physicists, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they have factual knowledge about what they're doing, what the, their, their their disciplines, uh, the the focus of their disciplines, right? So, factual knowledge about about knowledge about the biological world, factual knowledge about physical world, et cetera, et cetera. But understanding 
I think, requires knowledge. That's why philosophers, in my mind, do have to pay attention to what comes out of the sciences. You cannot do, I don't believe anymore that we can do first philosophy. That is philosophy from first principles. That one, in my mind, died with Descartes. That was the last great attempt. Um, and that's why, not that I want to open another can of worms, but that's why I keep um, pretty much blasting people that talk about panpsychism and, oh, and hard, God. yes, and hard We're problems. We're in another very annoying stuff. Twitter conversation about that. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> why? Because these people think that, you know, it seems like they learn nothing from, from the demise of the, of the Cartesian project. They still think that it is, in fact, possible and even desirable to sit down in a chair, think about stuff, and then discover things about the world. No, I'm sorry. We know at this point it's not. That is the business of science. So if, in fact, it turns out that the universe, that, you know, consciousness is an elemental um, you know, aspect of the universe, that it's going to come out of physics, not of metaphysics, okay? End of story as far as I'm concerned. But... Um, that said, understanding, I think, requires knowledge, which is, as I said, why philosophers do need to pay attention to science, but it's insufficient. Look at your, your own example of, of um, uh, you know, Krauss. He doesn't understand the nature of, um, you know, of mathematics versus physics, even though he knows a lot more factual physics and theoretical mathematics than either one of us uh, does, or that either I or Dan Dennett did. But he, does, he lacks understanding at a higher level. Now, why does that matter? Well, why does it matter, you know, to know or understand things? Because that's what we like to do, right? We like to navigate a world that we understand better and better. And so the role of philosophy, in fact, I, one of the main reasons that I was attracted to philosophy in the first place as a practicing scientist is precisely because it allows you uh, to get to that higher level of abstraction, philosophy by itself doesn't discover things. That's the, that's the nature of, that's, that's the business of, of science. But philosophy as a, as a sort of, the nature of the discipline is precisely this ability to draw from a number of different fact, uh, bits and pieces of factual knowledge, other discipline, et cetera, et cetera, to make a coherent picture of the whole. We had a separate uh, show on uh, Wilfred Sellers, for instance. Right? I was just going to bring yes, up. exactly. It almost seems right. to me like philosophers are ringleaders of the manifest image, right? I mean, they're the ones yes. who, who, in a sense, coordinate the interpretation of the scientific image Correct. into a, into a narrative that then becomes our manifest image, it almost right. seems. Yeah, and yeah. why does that matter? Because the, the overwhelming... Kinds of beings we are, right? Exactly. <laughs> because the overwhelming majority of human beings are not professional scientists and they still want to understand yeah. what the hell is going on in the world and how the world hangs together. Yeah. And that has to come through the manifest image. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. The, the project, the Salarsian project of modern philosophy understood as the only uh, discipline capable of looking stereoscopically at both the scientific image and the and the... Uh, manifest image and make sense of the two and how they interact together. That is what philosophy is about. What modern philosophy is yeah. about. I yeah. Think. That paper is criminally underutilized. Um, Absolutely. Um, 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 and I, I keep finding myself every road leading back to it. And I think at some point it's going to coalesce enough to where I'm going to be able to really write something substantial on it, but it's just, everything keeps going back there. All right. Let's talk about lived life now in the last segment. Um, um, because that's, I think where, you are sort of, A, it's where you're the most focused, and B, it's where you're the most sort of um, invested. And so let's, um, let's talk about that. Um, um, talk to me about the way in which philosophy makes one better at living. Um, and because um, um, you and I had an exchange where I said something of the effect of, you know, my grandmother is a much better person than I am, or right. I lived a much better life than I at least have thus far. And uh, does, didn't know a lick of philosophy. Though, funnily enough, her second husband was a phil was a Hungarian philosophy professor. I don't know if that means anything. Yeah. But, maybe uh, maybe <laughs> she observed something. Well, now look, so please, I don't know. Explain yeah. what you mean on, in that area. So this came out, as, as you remember, because uh, one of our Twitter uh, interlocutors there brought up this this uh, issue, which is true, this this finding that is true, that there have been num now a number of studies, uh, so this is not just a single study, that has been repeated under a number of different conditions, uh, coming out of the so-called experimental philosophy, which in my mind is simply uh, experimental psychology applied to, to you know, philosophical issues uh, or, or, or disciplines. But anyway... There is this, this series of studies that shows that um, 
uh, on average, professors of moral philosophy are not more ethical than other academics. Now, this has been measured by a number of sort of quantitative measures that one can have, you know, can raise issues about, like, for instance, how often they call their mother, uh, uh, how often they... they I don't know work. that you can measure someone's ethicalness, but... but um, yeah, but, you know, but, but, well, if you want to do science about it, you have to, right? Yeah. So that's why these, these funny kind of things, like, you know, how, how often they return, uh, how promptly they return their books to the library, you know, that's, that sort of stuff. Oh, how, how often they don't screw our students don't screw. yeah well yeah that would be another one um or if whether they're vegetarian for instance uh you know assuming of course the, the background assumption there is that vegetarianism is more ethical than other kinds right of, right etc cetera, et cetera. right uh, you know i mean you we can raise methodological issues there but i think we should set them aside for a minute and just for the sake of discussion take for granted that these studies are indicated something uh, of substance and that sub- something is hey look there's a bunch of people who know everything about John Stuart Mill and Kant and Aristotle and Socrates, and yet in their day-to-day life, they don't seem to behave any differently. They don't behave worse. They don't behave worse, but they don't behave any better uh, than their peers who don't know all that stuff. So what is it good for? So, so, so ethical, you know, expertise in, in moral philosophy, what is it good for? It's a damn good question. I have to say I was highly disturbed uh, when those studies started coming out, right? Because it's a... I suspected it already, though, from the anecdotal evidence. I mean, I really did. I mean, I just sure. – some of the worst people I can think of, I mean, other than real hardcore criminals, but just in terms of, like, social, socially dysfunctional right. um, philosophers, I mean, they just seem to behave terribly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I would say, actually, that academics in general have I some agree. kind of so, I, you know, social I issues. Yes, I agree, yeah. But nevertheless, I was disturbed by this thing. And, and so then I started thinking about it. It's like, okay, so wait a minute. What's going on here? And it seems to me that what's going on is actually fairly plain once that we start thinking in a, in a, in a certain way. Uh, professors of moral philosophy are technical experts on what? On the discussions that have been going on in moral philosophy ever since Socrates. So they can tell you the difference between utilitarianism, different types of utilitarianism. They can tell, talk to you about metaethics. Uh, they, can, they, they can tell you what's the difference between a moral realist and a, and a you know, moral emotivist and so on and so forth. And those are all tech, And in that sense, they are in fact experts. There's no question about it. Again, if you don't have that kind of background knowledge, you're not going to be able to enter into those discussions, even let alone contribute to those discussions. The problem is that none of these people, or very few of these people, actually we mentioned Singer earlier, I think Peter is one of the exceptions. Very few of these people actually even consider that though that knowledge should have an application. Not only they don't consider it, but when it is pointed out to them, they scoff. I have uh, encountered a You've number had of these conversations with this. Yes, family. absolutely. Describe I've one. <laughs> I've encountered a bunch of convers- uh, uh, you know, a bunch of people in my field, in my area, that when they hear that I practice stoicism, um, uh, they kind of either, they the, their reactions range from a smile, a condescending smile, to uh, you know comments such as like, "Why are you wasting time with that sort of stuff?" Or, "Oh, it must have been that you run out of ideas." Uh, is that the, only because it's an ancient, originally an ancient? Because they wouldn't say that presumably to Peter Singer, who's living out a utilitarian. Is that because it's old? That's a good question. I don't know. I need to talk to Peter about, <laughs> about that. Whether he see, gets similar reactions right. from people. But I, but I suspect he will. I suspect he does. Mm-hmm. I suspect that uh, a lot of people don't think as highly of uh, Peter. I'm, I'm talking a lot of philosophy, uh, professional philosophers. Don't think as highly as uh, Peter. Uh, precisely because he spends a lot of time talking about applica- app- applications. Of these really? That's, in- that's interesting. Well, I interestingly, I, had, I run into the same attitude in the sciences as well. And not just for my own in, uh, you know, involvement in, in sort of public understanding of science, but I've heard people saying, oh, Carl Sagan must not, not have been a good astronomer because he was spending a lot of time running for the general public and so on and so forth, which is really bizarre. And it's also empirically false, by the way. Somebody has actually done a study about the technical output of, of, of Carl Sagan. So this attitude is there. And it basically says, now this distinction between, let's call it theoretical philosophy, okay? What we, what we today do, a lot of what we do today in sort of uh, academic departments and certainly moral philosophy. Let's distinguish between theoretical philosophy and philosophy as the art of living, just to use a, uh, a different term. 
Is that, that what you, when you say practical? Is that, was right. that what you yes. Mean? And that's, that's right. separate from public philosophy. That's another conflation, right? Agreed. In yeah. fact, one of the reasons I don't use the word practical is because practical has a number of connotations. For instance, one could say that bringing in uh, ethical principles, you know, from philosophy into discussions of political, in political science, or, 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 or you know, of, of uh, sort of. Um, implementation of particular policies that would be that could count as practical philosophy the specific type of practical philosophy i'm referring to is what i call the art of living and that's not my term this is a term that's been around for a long time right so in other words actually practicing philosophy in your own everyday life okay um socrates was that means primarily ethics and maybe to a certain extent political or civics Right. Correct. Right. Yeah. Although to some extent also I would say epistemology because yeah. you have yeah, to, you yeah, know, yeah, right? Yeah. So in terms of virtue epistemology, yeah, 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 right? Yeah. That sort of stuff. But yeah, primarily ethics. Yes. And that was the problem with those studies, right? That they were looking at the ethics of moral professors, right? So I suspect, in fact, I'm pretty convinced that uh, the reason those studies found the results that they, they did is because most, not all, but most moral uh, professors of moral philosophy do not practice the art of living. They don't actually think that is their business to practice philosophy in the way in which the Stoics did or Socrates did and so on and so forth. Um, to me, that's a little disturbing because I would think that if you understand ethics that well from the inside, it would kind of come natural to actually also practice it, you know, to put in, into practice those, those kinds of things. But it apparently doesn't. And I think, I suspect that one of the reasons it doesn't is precisely what we've been talking about since the beginning, which is philosophy has become a highly technical field where people have to spend an inordinate amount of time on minutiae of you know, previous authors or new positions in order to make a new contribution. So it's a business. It's, you know, you get, you get your paycheck if you produce a certain kinds of technical papers, not if you live better your life. Uh, you, don't, you don't get tenure... Yeah. Being, for being a, a a good neighbor, right? I mean, no, you, you correct, <laughs> correct, exactly. Um, now, I think that that is too bad because I don't think the two are, are incompatible. And in fact, I also think you know there's nothing precluding somebody from becoming a technical expert in moral philosophy and also trying to do you know to live a better life. Peter Singer being the obvious example. I mean, Peter unquestionably, whether regardless of whether one agrees with his own specific views, uh, his own take on utilitarianism, etc unquestionably is published a number of high quality technical papers and books. There's no question that he's a good moral philosopher in the sense, in the technical sense of the term. There's also no question that by and large, he tries to live his philosophy in, 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 in actual real life. So I, so he's a quintessential demonstration that you can obviously do both. I am not because my technical expertise, it's not in moral philosophy. It's in philosophy of science. So I'm it, at this point, you've done so much ethics that it seems to me at this point, you may not have been yeah. formally trained, but you've done so much ethics. But I haven't published uh, uh, that much in the way of sort of pop technical papers on, on, on ethics or books on ethics. I don't consider myself a technical moral philosopher. I do try to practice the art of living uh, to, to the best of my abilities. And I do, and I, that is, in, of course, informed by my understanding of the, of the literature in ethics. But I don't, I'm not a technical person in that sense. I'm a technical person in terms of, of philosophy of science. So I'm not a, as good an example as, as Peter is. But more broadly, I think that is a problem, not only for those people, sort of for those specific people we're talking about who are technical moral philosophers, theoretical moral philosophers, and yet don't practice the art of living. It's a problem because I think that we will attract a lot more students and more interest in the general public if we drop this insane notion that anybody who does practical philosophy or talks to the general public is somehow an inferior scholar and somebody that doesn't need to be paid attention to. That is insane. That is shooting yourself in the foot in terms of an entire field. Scientists have learned that lesson. They used to do the same damn thing. As I just mentioned, Carl Sagan, who did not get into the Academy, the National Academy of Science, precisely because people thought that he wasn't a good enough scientist, even though, as it turns out, he was. Things changed not longer, long, long after that. And they changed, for instance, uh, Stephen Jay Gould, who was also a major popularizer. He did get in the National Academy of Science. Not only that, but the Society for the Study of Evolution, for instance, that with which I've been affiliated for a long time, 
uh, around that same time, and actually studied for the very first time to host conferences about you know, uh, popular science, uh, give out prizes to scientists who write for the general public, etc. Now, what happened? Is it the case that scientists all of a sudden got wiser than philosophers? No. What happened is they started getting hit in the purse. All of what I just described happened in the early 90s, studies starting happening in the early 90s. You know what else happened in the early 90s? The New Kid Rich Republicans who came to Congress, among other things, with the open agenda of undercutting science uh, uh, funding, in particular funding of evolutionary biology, because a bunch of their constituents are creationists. Once that, that started happening, all of a sudden you have the Geological Society of America, the Ecological Society of America, the Society for the Study of Evolution, all these people who say, hey, you know what? We should really talk, take these things seriously and talk to the general public and actually encourage our members not only not to dismiss it as a, as a waste of time, but in fact, it's integrated in, into a major way of doing science. And the result, you know, several decades later, is that now we have a large number of prominent scientists in physics, in biology, in all sorts of disciplines, who write for the public, talk to the public, and they're not made fun of, at least not as, as much as they used to, uh, you know, before. Philosophy hasn't gotten there yet, which is bizarre, because philosophy is already suffering from, uh, uh, you know, bad reputation in the general public. It's the quintessential discipline that it's a waste of time. You know, typically people, you know, my students come in and say, why should I ever, you know, graduate in philosophy? What is that going to do? With what am I going to tell my mother who wants me to be an engineer? You know, and that sort of stuff. So we already have that problem. And so I don't understand why, in fact, we don't embrace this notion of, yeah, there is a practical philosopher, and, and we should be the first ones, of course, to practice it, to put it into practice. Some areas of um, technical philosophy do that, I think, I suspect. For instance, uh, all those people that write a lot about race issues or gender issues and things like that, I would like to see systematic studies about it, but I bet that they are, in fact, uh, more ethical in those specific areas than your average academic. They are more careful about how they interact in terms of race, gender, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I would like to see the data on that. that that's, a, that's an empirical question. Anecdotally, I cannot accept that, but, um, I mean, that may be a debate for different well, places. Yeah. I find those people tend to be much more likely to be ideologically captured to a degree to which they actually behave quite awfully in the public sphere. Um, um, <laughs> oh, I'm thinking about someone like Rachel McKinnon, who's a, who, who's a, who's yeah. a prominent trans philosopher at the university at Ch college of Charleston, who has been involved in very, very public um, aggressively public campaigns to try to destroy people's reputations and livelihoods, no. including okay, someone like Martina Navratilova. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I remember that. And so I, I guess I don't, I, from I, see, there, I see it leading to a kind of ferocity in public life that perhaps. is as often bad as it is good. Perhaps. And yeah. as you said, that's yeah. a whole different kind of discussion, yeah. Yeah. but you have to grant even people like that that they are trying to practice what they preach. Oh, I agree. And they think yeah. they're doing good. I definitely Correct. agree with exactly. that. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Yes. And the rest of us, I think, should try to do the same, yeah. uh, perhaps in a more constructive yeah. and less destructive way. No, no, no. But it, the point is well taken. It's not really a relevant point because the question is, what. look, you can always fail at trying to live well. Exactly. The question is whether you are trying to live well. But the real question that I want to sort of push you on is um, – what kind of expertise is it that you are claiming advantages the philosopher in trying to live well? I mean, that's what I was sort of getting at um, um, when I mentioned, sought to brought the example of my grandmother, right? Right. Um, right. What expertise is it that advantages the philosopher in trying to live well? Right. Well, I didn't know your grandmother, so I'm not going to speak about well, your I'll grandmother. Mention, I'll say some things about right. her, depending I, on what you say. But I know my grandmothers, right? And they had a fairly good life. Uh, I think actually, if I have to think back ethically, one of them actually raised, uh, you know, rose to levels of ethical standards that, that I wish more people had. The other one was kind of a more normal person, which is, you know, making up stuff as, as they went. Um, the claim is not that philosophy is required to live a good life. I think that would be far too much of a claim. I do think, however, that the examined life is more likely, the self-examined life, the consciously, art, you know, consciously pursuing an art of living, is more likely 
to lead to an ethical life. And moreover, it's more likely to lead to better levels, to higher excellence in that ethical life. Why? Well, because you're thinking and reflecting about it and, and building your reflections and thinking on the basis of two and a half millennia of traditions. Let me put it this way, for instance. Can you be a good Christian without ever listening to you know, a, a, a sermon or, or reading the Gospels or, or anything like that? Sure, you can. You can kind of pick it up as you go from society, from peers, from et cetera, et cetera. But I would argue that if you're serious about being a good Christian or a good Buddhist or a good whatever, um, it does help if you stop and think about it from time to time, if you read some of the texts, if you listen to somebody who has actually spent some time you know, uh, 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 thinking over this stuff and say, ah, it turns out that some of my intuitions may be incorrect or, or I can actually do better. I can pay more attention to, uh, to what I was doing and improve, become a better, better person. I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. The, the, the notion here is not that unless you're a philosopher, you know, in the sense of, practical philosophy and you know art of living or something like that you don't live you don't you cannot have a good life the, the notion is simply that uh, it is more likely that you will be able to improve and do things more uh, uh, consciously and 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 pay more attention if you actually do in fact pay attention if you if you reflect on this kind of stuff all right let me let me on this on this specific point um it seems to me that the, there are two separate things. The first of which strikes me as uncontroversial, and the second of which is what I guess I'm I'm wondering about, or even perhaps right. contesting. The first thing is that um, some degree of self reflection and self consciousness, and um, 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 uh, is is a, a definite advantage for the person trying to live uh, to right. live well. Okay, that's, right. that's uh, uncontroversial, right? Okay, that's right. is uncontroversial, and that's. In my view, the all that Socrates meant by the by the, by the unexamined life versus okay. the examined life. That is a different thing from saying that the examined life, by way of the study of explicitly philosophical texts, advantages you. And that's, I guess, what it is I'm contesting. Right. So certainly, my grandmother and some other people I'm thinking of, all of whom I think are live have lived or are living better lives than I have. Um, certainly they are all reflective in the first sense. Yeah. None of them, however, w- would satisfy the second uh, description. And I'm wondering what you think the relationship is between the two. Yeah. So here I'm going to have to draw on my own experience over the last five years in sure. stoicism. Right? Sure. So um, I actually think I'm deeply uh, 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 sort of uh, aware of the fact that practicing stoicism has improved me as a person, maybe a little bit, but it has. Now, did that come out of reading, you know, abstract uh, uh, treatises by Chrysippus on logic? No. Um, In fact, Epictetus himself says to his students, if what you're doing here is you want to look to do logic chopping and, and learn all about Chrysippus, then all you're doing is you're essentially uh, 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 wasting my time and yours. Uh, you're engaging in, you know, the equivalent of literary criticism by reading Homer and dissecting it. That's not what you want to do. The kind of texts that make a difference and have made a difference to me in the practice, in actual practice of stories, are not high-level scholar scholarly dis- debates about or discussions about stories. I do read those, but that those I read only for my own personal. Uh, you know, interest, right? So I, I, I read, for instance, uh, interesting books on, on the history of Stoicism or how it relates to, uh, relates to other Hellenistic philosophy. Those are all great, but those are just my own curiosity. They don't make any difference in practice. The books that made a difference in practice are uh, Epictetus and Chiridion, Marcus Cyrillus' Meditations, Seneca's Letters, and their modern equivalent, because there are some modern equivalents, like my own, if I may plug myself, um, How to Be a Stoic or a Handbook for, for New Stoics. Those are not technical books. Those is, that's not technical philosophy. This is, those are the equivalent of what a Christian or a Buddhist would read um, in the course of their practice. The Gospels, of course, Epictetus is not Jesus, so I don't treat Epictetus as scripture, but pretty much the equivalent. Uh, or, or manuals on, on you know, books on how to practice meditation or, 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 or things like that. Those are the things that made a difference. Now, I still think of myself as a, generally speaking, 
uh, ethical person before I started doing all of this. But I definitely think things have improved since because I have more tools, right? I have specific exercises that I can do. I've started journaling, for instance, in a very particular way. And that has increased the, you know, I, I've always been a self-reflective person. And so as your grandmother, uh, from what you're telling me, but having actually specific tools that work in a certain way, right? So you, you pose yourself some certain specific questions on a regular basis, et cetera. That has improved, that has systematized my practice far more than it used to be before. Before it was like, oh, all right, I'm making this stuff as, as I go and I'm doing okay. Now I have tools. Those tools are not technical tools, but they still are not a question of knowledge and expertise, meaning that if I had not started reading people who have written this stuff before me and thought about what works and what doesn't work, what exercises work, what, what texts are more inspiring and so on and so forth, then I would have sort of been going in a, in a, in a kind of random way and not made as much progress. Does that make sense? It does, and I'm. Uh, but here's the thing that I'm. I guess I'm, is, is, I'm listening very carefully because I'm trying to figure out what I think of this. Um, you've thought a lot more about this than I have, and so, um, and I just my. It's more that I have these in, very instinctual reactions to to certain things that are being proposed. I guess what I'm thinking is something along the lines like this, and that is. So it does have to do with the distinction between knowing how and knowing that. And I think that living well yeah. is, is, is like the quintessential example of knowing how to do something. Yeah. Um, and I guess what I think is that to the extent to which philosophers have been able to explicitly articulate those things, they are in a sense what I've been, what we've called post hoc rational reconstructions yes. of what are the, the temperamental, characterological, dispositional traits that um, that tend to produce, uh, that tend to yield living well, yes. and that these are all things that actually um, arise entirely naturally in people, um, but are are and then are transmitted as a result of acculturation, sure. but that are only. Um, philo- philosophically articulated in a sort of a post hoc manner. It's thus. What I have found is, and this is why I tend to think this way, that the people I think live the very, very, very best are the people to whom those temperamental, characterological, and other traits simply arise naturally within them or naturally, a combination of naturally and as a result of um, acculturation on the part of others um, 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 who have, um, and that those who who kind of of pursue it in an explicit way um, tend to be a little too self-conscious about it tend to be um, tend to also um, um, uh, risk straying sometimes into hubris or self-importance with regard to it. Um, yeah. And that the, that the people I sort of admire the know most are the most natural and the least explicit in terms of their, um, in terms of their uh, examined lives, so to speak. Um, and I don't well, know whether you think that's, 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 that's interesting. Or, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think it's an empirical one. I mean, we would have to, to see what kind of some more or less systematic evidence about, about this. There certainly are people who are natural in the sense that you're talking about. And in fact, I encounter even people within stoicism who say, you know, this thing is actually pretty much what I was doing before. Yeah. Uh, except that I this simply put, put, put a, put a, put a, a frame or a language to what right. I kind of instinctively Correct. was already doing. But even then, uh, Every single one of the people, and now these are these testimonies are, of course, still anecdotal and unsystematic, but they're now running to the hundreds because I've been doing this thing for, for years, if not thousands. Um, I cannot recall a single case of somebody saying, you know, I was kind of naturally doing the same thing, and then, therefore, this is not really useful for me. It hasn't improved things. Every single one of those people say, but this one has systematized it. It has helped me because it makes sense of, of certain things. It also has helped me get rid of some other, uh, uh, you know, behaviors or attitudes that I actually didn't, you know, didn't think about that carefully. It has uh, given me a, a larger, broader arsenal of thinking tools and practicing tools to do things. So even those people, once exposed to a systematized philosophy like Stoicism or, as I said, Buddhism or Christianity, etc., they actually tell me uh, that they had the same experience that I've had, which is, no, that's, an, that's definitely an improvement. Uh, it's the same improvement, I think, that you would find between somebody who is, let's say, I'm going on a, on a limb out here, a natural musician 
and somebody who takes actual, you know, who studies music and takes and, and exercise and takes lessons. Now, you can be a natural musician. You can even be a Mozart, but you're going to be better if you do it with, you know, in a systematic way with good teachers uh, in, in, in a way that polishes out uh, certain things, uh, uh, you know, certain bad habits. Maybe, and, you know, I, I don't know if I agree with that, but you're right. It's an empirical question. And we don't, we don't want to debate anecdotes forever. I mean, I just can think of right off the top of my head of a number of musicians who can't even read music and who are far, far superior at what they do than more schooled ones, precisely because the schooling often yields a kind of self-consciousness and therefore a kind of affectation that actually mars the performance. Um, 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 and so, and, and same thing with painting and other, I'm not saying that this is always the case. I'm saying it's sometimes the case. And, and I guess I wonder if there's an analogous thing. And again, I'm not debating this because this is just trading anecdote. Well, but I'm wondering I know where there's an analogous thing with respect to living, right? I know where there's a, a field where it's, there's more than just anecdotal evidence sports in particular soccer playing right okay um so there's a lot of natural talent out there uh but as it turns out uh yeah once you get into s- s- training uh where there is expertise there's, there's there are trainers who actually don't you know again work on your habits they they smooth out the stuff that is not working very well they improve the stuff that is working well they give you hints on how to do things in a different way that's how you get a professional soccer player um, I think it would be really hard to argue that uh, expert knowledge of, of practices, because we're talking about practices here, right? Expert knowledge of practice or, or experience of practice, if you don't want to call it expert knowledge, experience or practice by people that have actually been practicing for a long time is either irrelevant, unnecessary, or in fact detrimental. Sure, we can always come up with examples of exceptional people who uh, have done a bunch of you know in- incredible things without any training whatsoever. Fine, but I'm going to bet, and as you said, this is an empirical question. I'm going to bet that for the general population, there's far more improvement to be had in any field by work- working with somebody who has actually had experience yeah. than not. Yeah, I've actually heard you know this is and uh, this is um, again not an argument, but it's a sort of an offering of an example from another area which might point in the opposite direction. I've heard a lot of people actually say that they think that the quality of literature of writing and novelists has declined since it's largely become a province of uh, um, MFA writing programs. Um, that, 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 that if you make a list of all the best novelists, almost none of them are, 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 are a product of writing programs. And if you look at literature since novelists have started getting sort of fed through these sort of writing programs that you actually find that the, that, that the quality of literature overall is far lower. I don't know. For that system. Yeah. But, that's you know. so far from my expertise that I have no idea. I'll ask my wife who, yeah. who actually does uh, creative writing. So. Yeah. Ask her whether she, what she bets. Yeah. I, I think she what she thinks. Um, but anyway, um, no, this is all very interesting. And, and all that I wanted to do because I don't have four views on this was to sort of pull out of you as much as I could. And, um, and raise the questions that I wanted to raise. So um, thank you very much. Absolutely. It was a pleasure as usual. <laughs> and um, our book is launching soon. How to, how to, how to uh, live a good life. Um, yeah. Speaking of which, right. <laughs> um, and um, uh, our book launching party is January 7th. And then January 7th. So it how do has... these things go? Will the, will the book, is the book available to buy? before the official launch or how does it work actually? So the book will actually be available for, from online sites and bookstores on January 7th. Although people can pre-order it at this point. Uh, I don't think that they can, pre- yes, I, they can pre-order it now because I pre-ordered my own copy, electronic copy already. Uh, because bizarrely authors don't get an electronic copy. We get a, we get hard know, copies, yeah. physical yeah. copies, but not electronic ones. Uh, so people can pre-order it actually already, already now. And uh, interesting, of course, that book, which we, I'm sure we'll have a couple of conversations about that one, with, including with some of the other yeah. contributors, uh, right? But that book is precisely about what we've been talking about yeah. in the last 15 or 20 minutes. It's about yeah. uh, a bunch of people who are living a certain philosophy, a certain uh, uh, philosophy of life and their experiences. And we're putting together the book precisely to help other people uh, yeah. uh, figuring out what they want to do and how they, they want to do it. And, and of course, as you know, 
Peter Singer has just endorsed that book. <laughs> yeah, and wrote a really very nice um, yeah, yeah, I did. review. And, yeah. you know, for all the criticisms I've made of him, I mean, he's obviously an incredibly important and, and serious guy. Um, um, and um, it's very uh, gratifying to have someone of that level uh, think so well of it. So a book launches, it's available online once it's launched. Then how long typically before you can like walk into Barnes and Noble and see it? Oh, usually on the same, same week. Okay. Because it leaves the the book leaves the warehouses like a couple of weeks before, and so it, bookstores should have it by uh, by that date. And also, we're going to be able to that. This is also exciting. My wife got more excited about this than about the book itself. Is that um, we're all going to have a part in the voice and in, in the audio book. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So people will be able to hear our wonderful. Um, um, rich voices in uh, right. at least a part of it. Now it's going to be mostly nar- read by a professional reader, but we're going to do the, we're going to read the introduction, the conclusion and the bridging sections, right. um, which yes. we wrote. So that's really so the nice. three, the three co-editors, the third one being Sky Cleary yeah. uh, are yeah. going to read those, those sections. Yes. yes. All right, Massimo, great talking to you. Looking forward to seeing you in January. Absolutely. And, uh, c- continued good luck, good health and uh, general happiness to you. <laughs> and to you as well. All right. Bye-bye. Take care, my friend.